Okay, design time, episode 17, because we're not counting. We have a couple new products that we're coming out with, ones that you won't be seeing until next year. This is a weld-on, it's made of steel, steering wheel quick release for our steering column kits, and it will bolt to the standard quick release of actually any quick release that you can buy that bolts to a hub, you can bolt to this weld-on piece. So. Essentially, this could be welded to our kits, which requires a three-quarter inch shaft. And in our kits, we sell the three-quarter inch shaft with U-joints and, and uh, column mounts and stuff. But uh, yeah, you could probably use this universally for multiple different types of builds. We wanted to do that because we like these quick releases a lot better than what we were selling, which were the quick car ones. There's nothing wrong with them, but they are definitely meant for dirt track. So that's cool. These, uh, these we just finished up. Next thing on the design time that I did last week, we went over assembling and building mesh files. Despite how good or bad the mesh files might be, there is a way to break them down and to make them work really well. And if you zoom in on these, you can see these are pretty crappy mesh files. And we still were able to make, actually this arm was really bent. So you can see the axis line of the control arm. I actually had one arm that wasn't bent, one arm that was, and the ball joint should be way over here to the left. So that kind of looks a little funny. And then the tie rod, I actually extracted this from a full mesh file and then separated it, which you can see, I think, here. So I actually took it out of this scan. But uh, this is really cool because uh, I was basically syncing joints together and allowed for a full assembly on all these components. So we have suspension travel up and down, and we have articulation, and I showed everyone in the class how they can do this as well. And from the bottom view, we can see some really interesting things going on with caster, Ackerman. Um, Ackerman is essentially toe at angle and what all of the scrub radius and dual pivot control arms are doing. And the only other thing that would be better than this is if we made a front suspension display, just like our rear stuff that you could actually manipulate and move around. Even though this is really well constrained, visually it looks great, we still can't instantly lengthen a control arm and see what kind of changes that has on, on different things. And if I look at, I'll just take the color off because it makes it look just a little more realistic. Also, for the first time in my life, I got high resolution screens. I've never had that before, and I don't know why I never had that. I didn't think it was that important. I thought that the refresh rate, the hertz, was important, and then I thought the resolution was important, so I just always bought screens that had like, you know, kind of a in between both. But actually, you don't need the refresh rate to be very high. Forgive me if I'm using the wrong terms. Also, I'm not a gamer. The refresh rate is for gaming so that you can aim and stuff and there isn't like a shadow being created. So with design work, we don't need that. We just need to maximize the resolution and uh, the hertz of these are only 60. But finally, you can get like crazy, crazy detail. And I don't know why I never did this, but it just, it's actually easier on your eyes to focus. So I guess if you do any design work, I recommend getting a, a decent monitor. Definitely will help. And then I've been really learning a lot about the setup of currently screen recording with OBS and I got a D D S D S R D S L R D S L R camera for the live stream. Putting all these things together, learning lots. So moving on, I've been working on Adam LZ's rear drift suspension where we're recreating a M3 knuckle exactly. There are differences between the M3, the non-M, E36, E46. They're not big differences, but there are differences. And I really wanted to go with a different approach here on this. So this is the outline of the M3 trailing arm. And if I go ahead and hide that, this is kind of the Minecraft version, so forgive me, but I basically wanted to go with a full billet knuckle that connects the shock, the upper and lower. He still runs it divorced, so he's gonna be still running the spring on the upper control arm and then the shock on this part here. So the knuckle's integrity has to be able to sustain the weight of the vehicle being applied to the upper control arm, just like factory. 
So we went with a fairly large aluminum design and this is actually going to be quite light and really, really strong. And then worst case scenario, we're going to be able to swap out one piece or the other because the trailing arm portion itself is separate. It's going to mechanically constrain itself to the knuckle using these alignment nodes basically coming off of the billet knuckle. And then it's going to use four studs, M12, and then we're going to have a single shear bolt just going through here. Um, this is basically persuasion, support, effort to limit the bending moment that's going to be happening right here because our driving force is going to be applied from the wheel going this way and it's going to be trying to bend this at all times right here. It's not that it would need this piece, I actually don't think it would, but for frequency control, adding this piece is going to limit any amount of uh, frequency that you would get through this suspension. And then the rest of it, we've made the rear grip kit for a couple years now on O'Sully, Sorensen, on Brand Dylan Hughes, on several guys. And it holds up to impacts, crashes, and anything really, really well. And then we're going to have our tow control here, shim design, same as our current setup. But uh, Adam was pretty adamant on their team having found the sweet spot of the M3, so they wanted a direct fit. You bolt this in, nothing changes. Other than it's going to have a bolt-on wheel bearing. I believe we found this one from an M5. Same uh, spline, larger bearing, and a bolt-on so that we can get away from the press-in style. This would be essentially really easy to change at the track if you messed up the wheel bearing. Um, so yeah, I have not come anywhere near finished this. And then I also was for many, many hours running some generative design work on the rear trailing arm portion only. And this is what it looks like when you have uh, generative design stuff going on. So I can hide these bodies and essentially what you're left with, all the red stuff is avoidance regions. Uh, all the green stuff is what we need to connect. So that's called preserved geometry. And the blue are the forces. I actually have a whole bunch of forces being applied to this thing. If we look at our load case, we have a whole bunch of forces here. I just have them turned off right now. So lots of force being applied in multiple different directions. We have forward drive, we have handbrake, we have impact, we have tire. It's basically getting dynamic loads from all directions. I don't have much to show for the generative design because I thought 2D, because it's essentially a 2D part, so I specified let's design this with a 2D axis constraint on the um, design parameters, basically the manufacturing parameters. So it's limiting the method of cutting this part down to a laser or water jet. So I'm thinking perfect, specify the forces, et cetera, et cetera, define some areas to avoid. It doesn't like it. Actually, I have way more luck with the full open, um, no limitations generative than I do with the extreme. So I'm gonna be talking with Fusion over the next couple of days and getting these things nailed down because you know, a lot of people are designing parts in 2D and a lot of people don't have access to generative unless it's like 3D printed plastic. But realistically, if we're building metal components, we have two axis is most common, maybe three axis. But once you get into five and castings, the metal 3D printing just isn't consumer ready yet. And there is still strength limitations because we still have annealing problems, layer bond problems, and we don't want to be making extremely uh, structural components, at least not for companies of our size. I know that large scale corporations have multi-million dollar 3D printers for metal and they are really focusing on fixing that. And that's always how it happens. We have the big corp testing the new tech that costs millions, maybe even billions to factor out. And then once the technology is there and, and created, it funnels down into a cheaper form, much like our 3D printers today. Five years ago, 3D printers were significantly worse and way more expensive. So the technology will come, but having the practice beforehand will be fantastic for when that time arrives. What I have to show for you, let's take a look. It isn't much. It didn't work and I don't understand a couple things. 
Like I said, I've had success with the open generative, but not so much with this. So I'm not sure why it's having the upper and lower section, but essentially that's what it's given. And then when I look at the outcomes, it actually said that it was not able to finish and I need to check a couple of the parameters. I went over the parameters, very similar to other things that I've done and it's always worked. So this is something that I'll be working on. And it's gonna show you guys that, you know, not everyone has it figured out. We're still trialing and erroring um, in terms of learning. For the meantime, um, I can just run what I would feel would be the best case scenario and then I'll run an FEA analysis on it. So if I get out of my generative design, I have already made this um, trailing arm section. So I would essentially do a similar tactic where I did the design and then I test the design and measure what the safety factor is, where the high stress points are, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also the alternative to this. And then to find what that is and then compare it to real life to try and break this is gonna be the ultimate goal. And uh, all that is the fun part, all that's the fun stuff. And then obviously real world testing on a real car. And then fortunately for drifting, these guys really like to hit stuff. So when Connor O'Sully is breaking wheels and just barely bending arms, but the trailing arm is still intact and still good, you know we've done the job. Wheels are easy to replace, trailing arms not so much. So we want to make these strong enough that that is not the sacrificial point, but we also don't want the subframe to be sacrificial either. We need something to give in between. Wheels being the absolute easiest, but Adam runs very expensive BC forged wheels and I know for a fact they are very strong. In a lot of cases in drifting, it actually makes sense to not have such a strong wheel. Um, because it's much easier. It's the easiest thing you can replace if you hit something. That's all I'm gonna talk about on this episode, but Joel put a air jack in the middle of the trunk, which is in the front of a Porsche 987.2, and he actually did the design on it. So, Jack, you can talk with him for a little bit. Okay, guys, we have this 987.2 Porsche came in, brought to us from Mantis Motorsports. They brought it to us because they wanted our fab skills and they wanted our wiring skills to do some prep work on this new race car that they got for themselves. So this runs in the Porsche Club of America down in the States uh, for the series. So this will be his 2026 car. And basically we're doing some air jacks. Uh, we're doing a bunch of electronics with a Bosch Motorsports ABS unit. But we're gonna talk about the uh, air jack system. One of the things that these cars do that a lot of people kind of had controversy on the internet is it's only got one jack in the front and two in the back. So because this is a mid-engine sports car, that's a 55-45 weight balance. So two jacks at the rear in front of the wheel wells and then one up here in the front. So what we did for the front one is we 3D scanned the trunk well or the front up here and we put it into Fusion and basically designed our weld plates to the front tube jack to line up with the body lines of the car even put the guy's logo in it for him, so he's super happy about that. And it was pretty straightforward, simple with a 3D scan, super easy to cut it out on the laser. So I'll show you on the 3D scan how we made this. So here we have our scan of the trunk. We just did the inside. And this captures all of the points that we need to basically line up our jacks, uh, jack mounts across the back here. So here is where I designed the mounting points. So I just did a section analysis to kind of get rid of half of this trunk here. And then basically I did a section sketch of the mesh model and then could trace this line out perfectly. So that way when we put it in and welded it, it was a perfect uh, lineup. So we built this model, put a little air jack in there. And that's how we determine how far off the deck lid we need to be off here. We're gonna add a small little uh, sheet metal around there just so it's a nice watertight seal into the trunk and we don't get any intrusion in the inside of the bottom of it. But added the guy's logo for him, little cut out there, just a little bit less material. And yeah, I think this is going to work really well for him. Seems to be the popular choice of these Porsche guys to run this front air jack mounted pretty much exactly like this. So using our 3D scanner and the Fusion software, insanely easy to make this, draw this, and then have our laser cut it out. So as you can see, the final design in the car welded. We just have to add our little tube in the bottom to basically match up this. But to drill the hole in the bottom, we made a perfect arbor through the top here, a nice hole saw through the bottom, and that's how we got this hole perfectly centered. We'll see you after Christmas. Merry Christmas, and next year we're gonna have even more stuff to come.